Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, the author of The Murder Room, Michael Capuzzo. Michael Capuzzo, author of The Murder Room, the story of the Vidoc Society. Is this for real? You know, when I first discovered them, Brian, I thought uh, it sounded like a James Bond, uh, you know, kind of story. And then when I met Bill Fleischer, who is the commissioner of the Vidoc Society and sends his pro bo agents around the country on these sort of secretive missions, it sort of felt like he was Q, you know. Um, but yes, it is for real. They're great detectives from uh, men and women from all over the world who meet once a month in uh, the third Thursday of every month uh, at noon in a, in a Victorian panel, you know, drawing room at former men's club in Philadelphia to solve cold murders over lunch. And they started as a social club and quickly discovered that uh, there was great demand for their services to really help people. And so now they, they have put a number of people in jail and, and proved others to be innocent, and they do great work assisting the police. Um, and they include, you know, just legendary figures like Bob Ressler of the FBI and people who have in uh, investigated the JFK assassination and uh, et cetera, all kinds of. Are they active police or retired? Yes, or both, what? a little of both. They, they are active in their prime, uh, you know, forensic psychologists and anthropologists and entomologists and blood spatter and, you know, experts on terrorism and sadism, anything you can imagine, as well as uh, retired, as well as cop retired, which is, you know, they, they, they retired 52 with a great pension and then they're, you know, private eyes and consultants and so forth. So is it secret in any way? It's secretive in the sense that, uh, uh, I mean, they do meet in, in uh, their first meeting place was the City Tavern, which happens to be where, uh, you know, the room where, uh, you know, the, the first Continental Congress met uh, and so forth in Philadelphia. So uh, and they were in the room where the first uh, Mason uh, you know, meeting in the, in the new world was. So there was that secretive feel to it, like out of a Dan Brown mystery or something. But they're secretive in the sense that, uh, well, they only invite, it's probably the world's most exclusive club, but you have to be a great detective by reputation, a great forensic specialist, sort of CSI to the 10th power, but real. I mean, there are 82 of them uh, to, be, to be asked to join. And it's a private club. Uh, and secretive in the sense that uh, when the police come asking for help on a case, they, they keep all, that, all those deliberations secret, you know, for sure. What are the meetings like? <coughs> it's, uh, you know, when I first discovered them, there was a website, the, the Vidoc, Vidoc, V-I-D-O-C-Q dot org, and it said cuisine and crime. And I thought that sounded intriguing. So they, they're in this, this, like I say, formal, like 19th century men's club room with white tablecloths and round tables. And they'll have a four or five course lunch. Uh, and then the fourth or fifth course, after the coffee and dessert has been served and everyone's chatting pleasantly, there's the uh, silver screen, the PowerPoint, and up comes the headless corpse, you know. Uh, and sometimes someone goes running out of the room, the guest who hasn't realized what, how gruesome or graphic it's going to be. But then um, Bill Fleischer, the head of the Doc Society, who founded it with Frank Bender and Richard Walter, uh, they're respectively a ex-customs FBI agent who's a private eye, and Walter's one of the world's top forensic psychologists and criminal profilers. Frank Bender, Philadelphia's own uh, famous uh, forensic artist. And uh, those three and their associates will stand and ask questions uh, of the police uh, or prosecutor who's delivering the case. For instance, um, Scott Dunn was murdered in Texas. Uh, he's a Bucks County, young Bucks County man, and uh, had moved to Texas. And his father brought the case to the Doc Society. And in cases like that, the, they will only work with police if police invite them in. And the police officers will. Um, stand in front of the, the group and, and run through the case, uh, you know, cold cases at least two years old. And the, the Vidoc Society will, members will ask questions, you know, suggest in, uh, approaches. And if they bond and if the Vidoc Society members feel they can really help find the killer or get to the root of a case, they'll go out pro bono and spend years helping in the field. And they select someone in the group to head it up? Uh, yeah, it's done almost sort of naturally. I mean, in the case of a a gruesome, uh, you know, Ted Bundy kind of killing. Everyone knows that has Richard Walter's name written on it because he's uh, one of the world's best at understanding those kind of sort of human monsters. Um, and so whoever's gifts are necessary, they'll begin to contribute in this sort of working group. How many cases do they handle at a time? 
They handle one a month, and uh, and over the years they've been going for 20 years now. It's uh, over 300, uh, and um, some of them are just casual lunches, and they provide moral support. And the cops go back to the Kansas Bureau investigations or the Tennessee small Tennessee Police Department, and others they really can really provide tremendous uh, you know help. Are there times they find resistance from local police who they are, they're dealing with? Yeah, that happens. I mean, it really is a, a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, where Holmes tries to stay in the background. They do uh, stay in the background. They're, they're not out for credit, uh, and they don't have, like, formal investigative authority. So what will happen frequently is they'll make tremendous uh, inroads on a case. For instance, they uh, essentially solved the murder of a, a young Drexel University student uh, some years ago who was found in the bottom of a stairwell, uh, and she was... She was um, had been brutally murdered, and uh, this was Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving, uh, and she was a, uh, living at home in New Jersey. She's a, a very attractive young blonde woman, a, a math major, and she still had her, you know, her watch on and her jewelry. Uh, there was no robbery. She was wearing her coat. It was fall. Uh, she was not uh, sexually assaulted, and so the cops would see really no, for seven years, the Philadelphia police, no real motive for the crime. Uh, Richard Walter points, pointed out when they brought the case to the, the murder room, the sort of court of last resort, that it was very significant that sh the only things taken were her shoes and socks. And he suggested they look at the arm. They had a suspect who was a um, prison guard, but they didn't really have anything on him. And he suggested they look at the suspect's army record for signs of foot fetishism. And sure enough, he had been court-martialed for that. It, it sounds like in some cases they look at it and make snap judgments about things. Is that, does the fact that they, are they freer than the police to, to make conclusions like that because they don't really have to come up with the proof? That's an excellent question. And I think it goes to the heart of how detectives versus, uh, you know, the profiler might work. Um, the police go on, uh, on fact, and they go one fact after another at a procedural method that was developed in the 19th century. And we want them to do that. It's a great thing. And when the facts stop, like in this case, they just had no more facts on the um, on this security guard. He seemed to have be at the right place at the right time to do the crime. There was nobody else who seemed to be an obvious suspect. They ruled out the boyfriend and so forth. But they just didn't really have what they considered hard evidence to arrest him. Uh, so Richard Walter and the Doc Society, they come in. And the snap judgment is just his particular genius of uh, not based on guesswork and not based on just intuition like a wizard, which people, I think, think of profilers, that they're kind of wizards who go under their little hats and, and, and dream this up. But based on years and years of evidence as a psycho uh, psychological uh, forensic psychologist and understanding of, of the, uh, the sexual perversity of foot fetishism and how it rarely leads to murder but what it really means and, and, and the positioning of the body versus in hundreds of cases indicates a certain type of personality type behind the killing. These type of things based on science and, and, and hard experience and some intuition. I mean, there is an art to it. I think we're human beings finally. Um, and they're able to say to the cops, not, you know, uh, we know this is so-and-so, go get him. You know, where we have that fear. Oh, you know, that's a Hispanic person crossing the border, go get him. You know, they, that's not how it works at all, I think, when it's done properly. Uh, it's, um, he's able to say, this indicates someone who had an unusual interest in foot fetishism. So I'd suggest you look into his record with that in mind. And it just helps direct the investigation. The cops still have to go out there and prove it and do the work for us as a society to, to you know, to, to prove that someone's guilty and not innocent, you know. You have a scene in the book where the people in the Vidoc Society are questioning a, an, in an interrogation. They're in the room asking questions of... Yes. They're, they're allowed to do that? It, well, only if they're invited in by the police. Uh, and uh, the police can um, respect them because as a group, uh, you know, Bill Fleischer was a Philadelphia patrolman before he became head of the U.S. Customs uh, Law Enforcement Division in uh, right here in Philadelphia for three states and uh, knows all the, you know, and is very close to the heads of the, the FBI, Marshals, Customs, et cetera, offices here. A and so with, pe with credentials like that, they, there's a lot of respect, and they work well together. Uh, so they will invite them in to help, and the Vidoc Society will do, you know, what they're asked. But uh, typically, they're more a proxy, uh, you know, analysis. But in this one case you're referring to, they, yeah, they, Bill and Nate Gordon are two of the best uh, interrogators anywhere. I mean, they, they are experts on lie detection, and they teach lie detection techniques to, uh, you know, the Saudi Arabian police and the London police. And so they were there in a small town in Pennsylvania, in Bucks County, helping sort of break down the killer and point out uh, how, the, how the seating should go in the interrogation and how to really get him to be intimidated by it and so forth. Where do they get their money? 
Uh, donations, uh, they, they uh, and you know, they have dues. And uh, Danny DeVito paid $1.3 million for a movie about the Vidoc Society uh, some years ago. When I first discovered them, that was in the works. And uh, I thought, boy, this sounds great. Maybe I'll do a, maybe they need a book too. So that movie has since lapsed. You know, it didn't make, uh, Danny DeVito's company went out of business. And um, they got to keep the $1.3 million? No, they didn't get all of that. They got just the beginnings of it. But the, the movie rights are up again, and they're attached to my book, The Murder Room. So there's actually a lot of interest in Hollywood and in TV land. Uh, that one of the executive producers of Lost sees it as a possible series. So, and some, some major actors have been inquiring about playing some of these parts. So it's, you know, it's been a, been a good start. You have a scene in here where um, the, this one gentleman, Walter, looked down at his pad. Frank Bender is right. The, the suspect. He'll be clean cut and living in the suburbs. He'll be married to a compliant woman who has no idea about his past and present a wholesome image to the community. And then I'll tell you, when you find him, uh, he'll be in Michigan and he'll be driving a black Cadillac. Now, was, uh, did they tell you these stories after the fact? Oh, sure. I mean, this is a... Uh, did you worry that they were maybe hyping themselves a little bit? I mean, this seems too good to be true. Well, I have to be cautious about that as a journalist. It, I spent seven years uh, on this fact, uh, checking and double checking and interviewing them again and again. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things that makes them so appealing. I mean, these are, they are, do seem too good to be true. They're very, I think that what I learned in this book is that the way we portray uh, cops and detectives and the great detectives, who, who these are some of the greatest detectives in the world in this group, um, is not really realistic. I would suggest to you that the drama you're seeing, the excitement, is more realistic than the way we portray them, like say on TV or in CSI store, you know, shows where it's all just sort of crew cuts and laser science, or even in thrillers. And I love thrillers, uh, where it's a sort of hard-boiled detective who sort of feels guilty about everything and you know has some ailment he's fighting. I love all those stories, but these these characters. I mean, Richard Walter, uh, you know, he'll actually. Um, we had a. There's going to be an ABC special in, in the late in the fall, uh, one hour on the book, and um, and we had to sort of talk to ABC executives about it, and they asked me to summarize these three detectives. And at one point, I said something about Richard Walter that he liked to, well, I guess this isn't uh, satellite radio, but he liked to bite the bleep off of perpetrators. And uh, to give you an idea, what Richard Walter, who is considered the living Sherlock Holmes by Scotland Yard, I mean, it, you know, he's one of the tops in the world, and he looks and acts like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but has the credentials to back it up. He came up to me afterward and said, dear boy, which is how he talks, um, about the way you described me to the ABC executives a few minutes ago. I said, yes, Richard. Uh, I had some concerns about it. I said, well, when you said I like to bite the bleep off the perpetrators, and I said, yes, he said, I'm glad you said that because it's true. <laughs> 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 so they really are characters. <laughs> well, yeah, you describe him as kind of a living Basil Rathbone. Yeah, right? he really is. I wish he was here because I can only do the impersonation, but he's the real, the real deal. How much did they let you in? Well, I got extraordinary access. I went to any meetings that I wanted and watched them you know, question and, and analyze. I uh, got to look over their records, such as they are. And uh, you know, I went with, um, I sort of went to their Christmas Eve and and New Year's parties and, and got to know them that way. I uh, had them to our, my house for weekends. And, and Richard Walter, uh, with him, I went to the American Academy of Forensic Science meeting, uh, annual meeting in Chicago, which is sort of the best of the best, uh, and got to know just dozens of these great you know, forensic scientists. And also a, a really striking group that I think goes to the heart of what they do and what the problem is that we don't often see. Uh, I went to the annual convention with this forensic psychologist, Walter, of the um, Parents of Murdered Children. Uh, in, and their, their headquarters are in Cincinnati. And as it turned out that year, they were having their national convention in Cincinnati. So picture a, 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 national, a convention ballroom in a Hilton hotel with uh, a dozen round white tablecloths and you know, ten to hun several hundred people there. And every single one of them has had a child or, or, a, or, a, or a cousin or something, young adults and children who've been murdered. And you, you see their stories. They have this sort of wall of, of tears uh, outside in the lobby. And you realize, as tragic as deaths are from drugs and all these other things we're familiar with in our society, these are often just the boy and girl next door. And, and I think that you know, we, we have a, a tendency in this society, and I can't, I mean, I, I can't keep up with all the cop shows and all the murders and all the sort of tabloid uh, TV journalism about it, uh, or all the, all, all the thrillers and so forth. But I think we, we kind of, it becomes sort of entertainment for us when the fact is, this, it, this doesn't even get covered by, say, the, the mainstream newspapers, this group barely recognized, and this deep undercurrent of, of suffering in America of, um, you know, th what they say is that the killer takes, uh, can take a whole family, in essence, because if 
God forbid somebody's nephew or child is murdered, you know, it takes a special character and help to not let woe sort of destroy that family, maybe for generations. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Did, did you cover crime at all when you were working for newspapers? Uh, yeah, I was a, I, I did some police reporting. I worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Miami Herald for a total of 17 years. And I covered every beat under the sun and, and hurricanes and, and murders. And, you but I did, the scene yeah. Of murders? Yeah, absolutely. I, I did a feature story on I hung around with the Philadelphia crime, crime Squad, and they showed me all their grisly pictures. And I did stuff on the Miami cops. And I was close with the Miami had some legendary police uh, writers who I sort of learned under the wing of uh, Edna Buchanan. And, uh, you know, so I had an appreciation early on for, for this kind of writing. Does it change you at all to be exposed to that side of life? I think it does, and, and I'm lucky, I was close to all three of them, but Richard Walter being uh, the expert in the world by most accounts on particularly sadism and sadistic killers and the worst type of, you know, where the Bundys and the, and the serial killers come from, uh, was able to, I was able to learn that, that, that that's a hazard serial killer investigators develop, you know, live with. Like they, their, their favorite uh, quote is from um, Nietzsche who said, you know, beware of looking into the abyss because the abyss will look into you. The danger is really for someone like that. I mean, they literally can lose their soul sitting there as close as you and I are as a prison psychologist listening to a sadist uh, describe the things he did to a child, his own child, with great glee, hour upon hour, year after year. And men and women who do that for a living are very eccentric or end up eccentric and have to have hobbies, have to have some way, God, poetry, antiques, love around them to realize that there's good and hope and beauty in the world, something to stand for. For me, uh, yeah, it was to write about John List, who killed his whole family uh, in New Jersey, and who the, the you know the two of the Dock Society members essentially caught in 11 days after the feds couldn't catch him for 17 years, to to study the way he massacred his mother, uh, his wife, and his three children, and to live with that for days and days. It really it weighed me down for sure. But I was good to have. I felt like I was a poor poor man's Dante, and I say poor, poor, poor man's Dante, Italian, American ancestry, the only commonality, <laughs> being led down uh, by Virgil to the, the depths of hell, you know. Uh, thank God I had a guide who has an incredibly mature moral sense of what all this means. And what you and I get to do as uh, vicariously in a way, we see through Sherlock Holmes, we get to experience the evil without really living with it, you know, like they do. Where's the name Vidoc Society come from? Eugene Francois Vidoc, V-I-D-O-C-Q, some of the Philly guys call him Vidoc, or uh, you know, all different pronunciations, uh, was a incredibly flamboyant uh, detective in, in Paris in the 1820s, 30s, uh, Emperor Jos Empress Josephine's hero and Napoleon's detective, and he was a criminal. Uh, he was a highwayman, a murderer, uh, you know, a mass adulterer, you know, master of disguise. And when he got tired of being in jail, he convinced the police chief in Paris of the day, of the day that really his, his uh, the guys with the billy clubs uh, and the uniforms were missing a lot of crime. So he said he convinced them to form essentially the first state de or city detective bureau. Uh, it was the, really the forerunner of Pinkerton, but also the Scotland Yard and the FBI. And so Vidoc became in that moment the colorful and redeemed criminal turned lawman. Uh, and, and he was famous for that. Uh, and then he was deposed by his enemies after some years and turned around and founded what became the first private detective agency uh, and, and hired again a bunch of criminals to be the first detectives. <laughs> so, you know, we see at the birth of this idea of the Sherlock Holmes character, in fact, uh, this dark eye, eye on the crime that the policeman doesn't have. There's a couple things you have. You have he, when he was young, he had been a rowdy, fearless teenager. They called the wild boar. He'd killed a man at 13, robbed his parents at 14 to leave home and eventually join the army where he fought constantly. He defeated 15 men in duels and killed two. And he's the... The model of the mirror model. of all Western yeah. detectives. And uh, Edgar Allan Poe's model for uh, right. his detective. Right. He, what happened is in 1829, he was a star of cafe society. And, you know, and, and in fact, so flamboyant, the only modern evidence we have of him is Depardieu did a, a movie some years ago, Vidoc. And it was science fiction. I don't think people can really accept the reality of a doc today. And there was a 1940s movie called Scandal in Paris or something that's supposed to be good. But um, Balzac was a friend and Hugo, Victor Hugo. And Victor Hugo based the two main characters in, in uh, Les Miserables on Badoc. And here is how we, we get the foundation of the Badoc Society and how he has lived through time. Because I there's Javert and Valjean, you know, and, J and Val Valjean is the the, the poor criminal who has stolen bread to feed his family, and Javert is the relentless detective trying to hunt him down. 
ev everyone's familiar with the story. But uh, that particular scene where um, becomes important here in modern Philadelphia, where Val Jean uh, is taken in by the bishop as an ex-con. It gives him a place to sleep out of mercy. And he steals all the silver from the, the bishop and runs to the outskirts of Paris. The gendarmes bring him back before the bishop and say, here's the thief. And the bishop says, no, he's not a thief. He's right, I gave him the silver, and I wonder why he didn't take the candlesticks too. And in that moment, uh, ja Valjean is sort of struck down by this divine forgiveness, by this love. And, and, uh, and this bishop says, I, I have stolen your soul for God or for good. You know, no longer are you a man of evil. The point being that Bill Fleischer, who grew up in Philadelphia and was like a potato wholesaler's uh, grandson and became a Philly cop and is the commissioner of the Vidoc Society, saw himself as a young VDOC, uh, a brawler, a sort of juvenile delinquent, who was always looking for redemption, uh, always looking for people to believe in him and felt that nobody did. And he finally made himself into a Temple University graduate. He went to the Army, became an FBI agent, and is really a famous detective today, and you know, head of the Vidoc Society. But in that redemption, he sees Vidoc as a redeemed man who had redeemed himself from criminal to lawman and who believed in the redemption of others, whose story so inspired you know, uh, Hugo to write, that, to write that immortal novel. And so that's the sort of spiritual, if you will, course that runs through the work of the Vidoc Society. What's amazing is that of the three founders, the, the uh, you know, Bender and Walter are unbelievably eccentric. I mean, they're kind of famous for that and just incredible. And Bill uh, Fleischer is a former, you know, federal bureaucrat. And you think, well, here's a fairly steady guy. He's a grandfather and father and lives over in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And he's also written one of the leading books on interrogation, you know, techniques. So here's a federal interrogator. And we know what people think of them, or what some people might think of them. And you ask him about that, and he pulls out of his desk drawer his, uh, you know, ear, you know, much worked over college copy of Les Miserables by Hugo, and says that the scene I just described to you is his favorite in all literature and changed his life. And you look up, and this tough Philly, now private eye, is crying. And he cries every time he thinks about it. And so they really are exceptional characters, I think, exceptional men. Too real for CSI, I suppose. <laughs> Tell me about Frank Bender. Frank Bender is, uh, is a, a, a genius. Uh, he's, uh, if he's not a psychic, he's working in some other dimension. He's the quintessential ladies' man, although his wife loved him till the end. Uh, he's f known and loved in Philadelphia and throughout Pennsylvania as the great forensic artist uh, who saw, who's put like seven most wanted criminals in jail by figuring out you know, what they look like and doing either a, a bust or a, a drawing to help police. And also has found killers, uh, identified you know, bodies moldering in the grave and said, this is what their face looks like. And people say, Frank, how do you do that? And he just says, well, it's the harmony of forms. You know, if the nose is left, I know what the mouth looked like. So he's really unique in history as a, as a forensic artist. And he, uh, he and Richard Walter make an incredible team because he's sort of psychic and a sort of always manic, cheery artist and it brags about his 300 girlfriends in addition to his wife. And Richard Walter is this sort of loner, dour Victorian who says he does, you know, doesn't like to be touched by man, woman, cat, dog, or child, and says, I, I loathe children. Actually, I prefer them with garlic. So you have these two extreme <laughs> you know, personality types. And just don't commit a murder because they can see through the living and the dead to find you. You, know? you, you, you <laughs> quote Richard Walter here talking to Frank Bender saying, Frank, you would have been burned at the stake in the 17th century. Now you'll just get shot in the back. <laughs> right. It's a <laughs> typical play with the two of them. You have a scene in there where, where um, one of them goes into this house where Frank Bender is boiling heads. Yeah, yeah. How do you get it? First of all, how do you get a head to boil? Well, Frank... Uh, he started as a student at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, a night student, and he didn't know anything about anatomy. He was an artist and a, and a painter. And so he went into, um, uh, you know, the, the, a friend invited him in to look at the morgue, the city morgue, and he started studying the bodies there. And there was a woman whose face was unrecognizable with decay. And the medical examiner said, there's no way we'll ever know who she is, no fingerprints. We don't know what she looks like. And Frank said, I know what she looks like. And he had this, uh, this native gift. Uh, and so then he did his first skull where he took the actual skull and built a, a, wa a plaster cast and built up the flesh and the eyes, trying to feel and intuit, based on science, but a lot of art, a lot of intuition, what she really looked like. The picture ran in a bulletin, uh, uh, bulletins around the country, cop bulletins, and eventually a detective said, my goodness, that's a missing woman who got on a plane from New Jersey to, to well, she lived in Phoenix, got on a plane, originally from New Jersey, to uh, Philadelphia and was never seen again. And after some investigation, they discovered that she developed the wrong boyfriend who had swindled her in a real estate deal and said, why don't you come to Philadelphia? We'll hang out. 
and she landed, and his way of doing the real estate closing was to kill her. And he turned out to be a mob hitman of some renown, and they were able to catch him. So to answer your question, how do you get heads, what happens is it, law enforcement will come to Frank and say, you know, we need you to do a reconstruction of this body found in a field. Sometimes Frank goes into the grave himself with legal permission and is literally like some sort of Dracula's Avenger removing the head or what's left of it uh, to take it back to his studio to reconstruct it. Um, he has amazing stories of passing through uh, airport security with a head in his, um, <laughs> in his uh, uh, suitcase. And he'll have a letter, you know, and they'll say, this was before, you know, 9-11 and all even, you can imagine today. And they'll have a letter saying, he'll have a letter from the uh, Philadelphia District Attorney's Office or the police department in Minneapolis saying, you know, this is all legal, please let him travel. But they'll say, no, no, we want you to open the suitcase. And he'll say, I don't think that's a good idea for all of your passengers. But uh, on several occasions, he's had, he, he boils, he has a, a, an artist's loft in Philadelphia on South Street that's fairly famous. It's about 88 feet long and it's lined with these rebuilt skulls and it's quite a scene. And he's got, he lives there with his wife and occasional girlfriends and family. And um, he boils his chickens in this pot and cleans it out thoroughly and sometimes, and boils the heads. I mean, this is, uh, I don't think his wife was keen on that process, but basically he's got to, if you want the technical stuff about it, he's got to uh, deflesh the, the skin from the head so he, of the corpse uh, so he can begin to build it up again with, with wax and plaster and so forth so to give a realistic look of what the poor victim looked like. 300 girlfriends? This is Frank, I should say, Frank has mesothelioma, he's dying. Um, his wife died last fall. Uh, he was very candid about all this and his wife is candid about it and loved him to the end. It worked for her, I think she wanted him out of the house a lot. He, all I can say is an artist and an artist's artist, a libertine. But uh, when I interviewed him at length about this, um, he told me that he'd slept with 250 women by the time he was 26. He was, an art, he was a model and an artist and a photographer and women just loved him. And uh, he married Jan and they had a, a life, great life together and had children and grandchildren. Uh, and he, I thought he was, he kind of called me up, one of the few mistakes in the book, and he said, you know, you put in there that I had, uh, I want to dispute my number of girlfriends. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't make a mistake on this. Was I drinking when he told me this? It does sound kind of outlandish. And he said, well, you say in there that after I got married, I just had, uh, I didn't ha have these like one night stands anymore. I had significant relationships with friends, you know. And <laughs> you know, Walter teases about this in the book. Let me get it. Let me get this straight. They're really friends now, right? And he says, "Well, that's true, you know." But you intimate that it's only half a dozen. And I said, "Well, what did I get wrong?" He said, "There were 76 of them while I was married. I sent you the names." <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm sorry, Frank. I got overwhelmed with studying all these documents. You know, maybe in future editions, we can correct it. So that's Frank Bender. He's a he's a you know, he's, he's very ill right now, and yet um, he was Esquire's Man of the Month uh, for his work uh, in Juarez, Mexico, trying to find out who killed all those, uh, those women down there. Um, and uh, he has a passion for life uh, that is pretty remarkable to the extent that um, he, the mesothelioma has filled his lungs. He, was, uh, he worked in a boiler room aboard a, a Navy vessel in the 50s, I guess, or 60s, and many years later this came back to bite him. And the doctors are astonished because at least two of his ribs have been dissolved by the cancer. And he really should be dead now, they say, or in terrible pain. And he's about 70, and he has a new 35-year-old girlfriend. And they go to the Jersey Shore together and jump the waves, you know. So there's something, he has something vital about him, that's for sure. And he reconstructed the face of St. John Newman? Right. This was, uh, you know, St. John Newman, who I think is an incredible really local Philadelphia story, really national uh, state story. I mean, how many tourists go to his shrine, you know, in Philadelphia? The saint who died in, what, the 1850s and to whom medical miracles are attributed. And when Frank's wife had fallen ill with cancer, Frank didn't know he was sick yet, happened to coincide with the time that he was hired by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, you know, with permission from the Vatican, no doubt, to go in and take the, um, I mean, if you go to his, uh, the shrine of St. John Newman in, uh, where is it, uh, northeast, not northeast Philly, but uh, Allegheny. Just a few blocks from here. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's, he's sort of under glass like, like a saint uh, or a, a figure in, in Florence or Italy in the churches. It's really remarkable. But his figure had decayed over time, so they hired Frank to rebuild his face. And he did a beautiful job. And the priests, uh, you know, were thrilled with his work. And at one point, I, during his work, they came over, the, the father from the St. John's, you know, Newman Parish there, came over to see how he was doing. And, and he said, by the way, my wife Jan has cancer. And, and so the, the father said, do you mind if I pray for her? 
and put this relic of the saint, which they carry, you know, a little piece of his bone or whatever in, in, inside a glass vial, something like that, on her and prayed. And Jan, and I don't think Jan and Frank were, were especially, you know, like weren't churchgoers. You know, they got married in a cemetery for fun. Um, and she said she felt this like soft lightning coursing through her and really believes, and so does he, that it extended her life for a year or two. I mean, at a certain point, like six weeks later, certain signs of the cancer had disappeared. In fact, I think there was some Philadelphia television coverage of that. Um, so that became important to them. And Richard Fleischer was the founder? Re uh, Bill Fleischer. Oh, Bill, Bill Fleischer. Bill and, Bill and, and uh, the customs administrator uh, and, and was close friends with Frank Bender, the artist. And um, he, Bill just loves characters, and Frank is one of the ultimate characters. And one day in 1990, uh, Frank said, I'd like you to meet my friend Richard Walter, who was the famous forensic psychologist and other character. And the three of them had lunch in Philadelphia and sort of cooked up this idea of a social club for detectives, which later became when they saw the real need, really through parents of murdered children and that suffering, uh, to really became a sort of an avenging pro bono group. But the three of them are the founders. And when you put this book together, how did you decide to structure it? It wasn't easy. One of the reasons it took me seven years, to be honest. Um, I had to tell the story of the Vidoc Society and its founding and these three men and how they fit together and how they were friends and rivals, uh, as well as the society has 82 full-time members and like 50 associates and, and, uh, and choose cases that, that uh, demonstrated their most dramatic cases, uh, success and failure. I mean, it's a little different than TV and that there's disappointment too, you know, and, uh, and weave that all into a coherent narrative. Um, I started going to uh, Goucher College for an MFA in creative nonfiction toward the end of this process, thinking I might have to get a real job someday. And um, I met Tom French, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, on the New York Times bestseller list with me actually right now for a book called The Zoo Story. And um, he was he's really a narrative genius. And he said, you know how hard it is to string together three major characters? I've almost never heard of it. So I take that as solace is why it took me so long mm -hmm. to do this. But uh, I, I, I'm told it reads quickly now, so I'm happy about that. How many different cases do you include in the book? Well, there are a handful of major cases as you sort of descend down this, this descent of evil, you know, through the eyes of the detectives, and several dozen of other, other cases weaving through it. I mean, some people have suggested it's sort of a book of short stories of, of many murder cases all we weaving together, along with these great characters who really make the story, I think. Do you have a favorite? Oh, gosh. I, I love them all. I love them as a, as a coherent uh, trio of the, uh, this sort of the, the tri tripartite great detective. Um, I guess Richard Walter uh, e emerges because uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, you still need uh, – one of the things I've learned from him is at the end of the day, we, we look more and more to science almost in every field. And in, and in forensics now, DNA, 25 percent of uh, murders are now solved through DNA. But one of the problems is, is that we're getting less murder convictions because detectives are forgetting how to think, forgetting to th that the human mind assigning meaning to the fact is more important than the brute fact that DNA is found. So the, the Vidoc Society, uh, Fleischer and Walter, do a lot of instinct? Yeah, you know, this is, uh, I think you're describing what fascinates us uh, with the Sherlock Holmes character, the Vidoc type personage in, in fact, fact and fiction all the way forward to today to the FBI profiler and Richard Walter, who's considered to be beyond the FBI profilers in his understanding of murder. And that is, you know, like I, we were saying earlier, the police deal with facts. And when they reach the wall where they have no more facts, uh, they, th there arose this necessity of someone who's sort of a dark genius, if you will, to say, ah, but this is how this individual thinks, you know. It might, it, some really great cops, even murder investigators, are sort of loath to admit to themselves that someone might have as dark a motive as doing something terrible to their son or their daughter. You know, they like to think sometimes that, or we like to think as a society, well, it got out of control, it was over money or jealousy, and you can almost imagine yourself losing control. And with true evil, I believe it's not that way at all. And, and you, you need someone like Richard Walter who, he, who can look at a, a serial killer and say, ta-ta, young man, why not, not to do such things? And also say, I know what fun you're having. I know what this is about, you know? And that helps because otherwise, if you don't think out of the box, the bad guys are, the really bad guys are, are, not, are not straight ahead, straightforward. So intuition plays a vital part, but based on experience. Do they take on cases that involve organized crime? You know, I can't think of one, except in the case of one of the cases where the, uh, the person who came before the Vidoc Society looking for help alleged that uh, the organized crime had covered up a murder. 
But uh, Richard, uh, actually, who, who leads in some of these cases, says he's bored by organized crime. He said because he's got all these murder archetypes that he's developed um, in terms of personality types that kill. And he said, I, I want to be intrigued by these cases. He said power, uh, you know, mob killings are all power all the time. They're as you know, unpredictable as a tire iron. I mean, it's the same thing again and again. Yeah, I want to ask you about those because you have in there the, uh, the anger retaliation and anger excitation and what's the other, RA? You had four, yeah, anger, four different uh, types uh, of murders. Yeah, four different types of murders. If I can tell you a brief story about how this came to be, uh, the FBI had developed these categories. Uh, anger, if I give you their handles, it might be easier to follow. Anger retaliatory would be, I'm sorry, power assertive, the first type uh, you can think of as a John Wayne type killer, who is the type of person you do not want to rear end in the parking lot, you know, uh, power driven. Uh, a Casper Milk Toast would be a fantasy type killer, power reassurance. And then an O.J. Simpson, although of course we know he's innocent, um, it, it would be the anger retaliatory type killer. And then finally, the sadist who's killing really for no reason except the pleasure of the process of killing, which is the most frightening, and that's where you get serial killer emerging. Um, th the, the FBI had it identified through rape studies uh, and then murder, rough equivalencies of, of this type. But Richard Walter and Bob Keppel, who is a Seattle investigator who's written a number of books and is very famous for uh, helping track down through computer analysis uh, the, the Green River Killer, uh, who Walter helped on, and um, Ted Bundy. He, so this Keppel in Seattle and Walter developed a new system that sort of uh, evolved beyond those, fo those, uh, those four types. Um, and Walter himself, uh, if you think of the four types as sort of a descent into darkness, the fourth type I think of as having a trap door going down because Walter has a proprietary system of sadism which once someone gets locked into it, uh, for instance, um, you know, millions of people look at pornography now. Um, one likes to think that many millions of them just go on to a normal day. Some don't. Uh, Bundy claimed that's what hooked him, although I think he's trying to push off his responsibility to some abstract agency. But the fact is that people can uh, disassociate themselves from reality. Like Bundy, he wanted a, a brown-haired girl, you know, and he fantasized about her. Healthy people uh, will go out and try to meet a girl with brown hair to be friendly and, and get to know them. Unhealthy people retreat into fantasy and he's, he's looking at the brown haired girl and that's not enough stimulation. Then he's looking at the brown haired girl getting tied up then that's not enough stimulation. It becomes this inexorable descent downward where the stimulation is in, insatiable need and it leads to you know, different crimes like uh, uh, stabbing or whatever and finally sadism, necrophilia, terrible things uh, where they're, they're not opening their heart to real relationships. You know. Any, are women killers any different than men killers? I, I, I wish Richard Walter was here to tell you rather than the, the journalist who wrote the book about him. But based on what I've learned from him and others, I would say, you know, there are distinctions, but the, the basic commonality is, I think it's a myth. It's, people say women aren't serial killers, but they are. People say that blacks aren't serial killers, but they are. Uh, the preponderance of serial killers have probably been white males, but uh, Walter would say, and he said this once at a college lecture, anyone can be a serial killer. All you have to do is wake up one morning and really want to which is a distressing thought, but, you know, it's nice to know what, uh, what's out there. You mentioned your years as a journalist. Can you talk a little bit about that? Where'd you work? What'd you do? I worked right here in this building for eight years uh, at the Philadelphia Inquirer as a feature writer under Gene Roberts in the sort of glory days of the Philadelphia Inquirer and had a great time. And seven years or more before that, I was uh, a reporter for the Miami Herald. And I went to Northwestern University Journalism School and then went to work for those two papers. Um, I edited my high school newspaper, but that's probably not of great interest to you. And uh, starting at age 15, and then um, uh, I quit to write books. I wrote for Esquire and, and Reader's Digest and uh, Sports Illustrated and a number of national magazines. And my last book was a New York Times bestseller called Close to Shore about the first shark attacks in American history, which happened in 1916 off the New Jersey coast. Uh, and really, in some ways, another Philadelphia story because it was a young Philadelphia man uh, named uh, Van Sant, who went swimming with his family, a wealthy man from West Philadelphia, and was attacked and killed by a great white shark off a of beach haven. And then this shark went on a, um, a sort of, you know, rogue a string of killings, four people inside of two weeks, and it became the, the foundation of the Jaws story. It's still referenced in the Jaws book and, and movie. So that was a, and I wondered why, I, it's like I did a shark serial killer, then I got into the real thing with uh, the Vidoc Society. What number book is this one, The Murder Room? Um, sixth book. Um, what are some of the others? Well, I had a, a sort of separate 
uh, career, uh, when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer and, and evolving into writing books, I started to write a humorous uh, column about animals. And, um, uh, you know, it's like I thought, what's the thing I'm worst at? And I thought humor writing. So I thought, well, why not try it? So, uh, you know, I wrote to the, uh, it ended up being syndicated in like 40 newspapers and became several books uh, on, on animals and dogs and so forth. And then um, I kind of realized that I wanted to do a more serious uh, journalism like I've been doing at the Inquirer and the, and the Herald, but in book form. And I came across the story of that became Close to Shore. How long does it take you to write a book? Close to Shore took two or three years. Uh, the Murder Room took five to seven. You know, it was a seven-year period, and I was working on other things too, but it was a lot more complicated. Um, and I'm so I'm glad that uh, you know the partners and and are happy with it. You know, the three men, and uh, although I could, you know, I was free to write whatever about them and included their many warts. Uh, and I, I don't know if I, I told you that we learned yesterday, it's only been out a week, that it, it was going to debut at number 11 on the New York Times bestseller list. So, uh, and it's been getting really good reviews. So we're, you know, my wife is glad because it did take seven long years. What do you do for income while you're working on a book for seven years? Well, y you hope that you get a very large contract. I was lucky in that respect in this book. But even so, the largest contract doesn't last seven <laughs> years. Uh, my wife and I started a... Um, uh, how does the answer, you do a startup business in journalism in the last five years, uh, <laughs> sound like a, a good way Lucrative. to to, go, to, <laughs> pi to pile on income? And I won't say it's been a financial success, but we have this magazine in northern Pennsylvania called Mountain Home that's been an editorial success. Readers love it. It's really based on the simple philosophy that, p that people love story, journalism, as attempted art in storytelling and in, in art and in phot photography. Now, in, in this book you have a uh, let's talk about some of the stories th some of the murders you tell about a, a woman who murdered her eight children yes how was that how was that not discovered by the cops in the first place that's a famous Philadelphia case and actually a famous national case Marie No was a poster woman for what became known as sudden infant death syndrome and in the 1960s people were so sad that this this Philadelphia you know woman living in a row house with her husband had had eight children and all died within days, weeks, or months of their birth. Uh, they'd all just turned blue and stopped breathing. And at the time, uh, some really, uh, the Philadelphia um, medical examiner's uh, office was, had some of the leaders in, in the country in understanding SIDS at the time. And they were suspicious. I mean, it just doesn't keep happening without really smart people saying, what's going on here? But they just didn't have the, the wherewithal, the understanding uh, to, to, to really, uh, you know, say that it was murder then. And then uh, Stephen Freed, who's a, a terrific um, journalist in Philadelphia, he was editor of Philadelphia Magazine and has won a couple of um, national magazine awards. And he has a new book out actually about the history of Fred Harvey, the uh, guy who sort of invented chain hotels in the West. Uh, so he's a good writer. But uh, Steve, uh, actually an investigative reporter, started to dig into it because there was new science about SIDS that maybe some of these cases were actually murder. And that came out uh, some years ago. Uh, and he started to look into this locally famous case. And he actually went and interviewed them, uh, the old man and woman, Marie, and her husband, Arthur. And then he went to the police, and he went to the Vidoc Society, and he went to Bill Fleischer and said, uh, can you help, help me with this? And a number of the Vidoc Society uh, agents, uh, you know, retired policemen and active investigators got involved to, uh, and ultimately the starring role was played by the Philadelphia Police Department itself uh, to get a confession from him. The, how does the Vidoc Society get its people to do their work if it's pro bono? You know, they have a great passion. Uh, that's one of the things I've learned about them. You know, cops are motivated, or these particular great detectives are motivated by a burning passion uh, about injustice. I mean, they, uh, you know, uh, Walter was speaking at the Friends Select in Philadelphia the other night for the book, and we were there with him, Bill Fleischer and I, and, uh, and he said, um, there are an estimated 100,000 uh, murderers in this country who've gotten away with it. This is how he talks in the last 30 years. He said, and they're walking around free. And he said, and I think that's wrong. And there really is that. And you know what? It was striking because we were on a panel uh, and it was just another comment from one of the, the stars of the book. And I'm on the panel. They're the people that you want to talk to, you know, the detectives. And people broke into applause. I think people are hungry for the sense that there are people who stand, other people who stand up for right and wrong who don't make postmodern decisions about, you know, about, you know, we, we, go, we all want to be sympathetic and redemptive and have our heart open. But uh, the reality is there's some people who slip into these sort of rabbit holes where terrible, terrible things happen. And thank God there are brave people who are there to try and protect us, you know. Do you like, they like publicity? 
They have a, a, a mixed relationship with it. I think they're happy, frankly, now to be recognized for all their years. And they have been in the New York Times, called them the heirs of homes, and People Magazine had written about them. Uh, the great thing about publicity for them is that it brings cases, because uh, people will hear about the Bedock Society and call them. And that's how they get their work. You know, they're not, they're not in the Philadelphia Inquirer or the uh, Harrisburg Patriot as a police department. Um, you know, they, they have mixed feelings. Uh, sometimes they feel that they've been overlooked, like the, you know, the case of the, uh, of the foot, foot fetishist killer that they played a crucial sort of Sherlock Holmes role in. Uh, they never got any credit, you know. But that's sort of typical. It's sort of archetypal, you know. Who was that masked man? They go off into the distance. Uh, and yet they, there's a mistrust. Uh, I'll say to my journalistic colleagues, I think that I maintain my independence, even though it was a pretty cozy relationship, because journalists and cops don't have a long history of togetherness. And as much as I was sort of on the inside of this organization, it just amazes me how often they would try to shut me out or do this or that. And it was just a long process of getting, gaining more trust, gaining more trust. Um, so, you know, it felt real, that's for sure. And they have a website you mentioned earlier. Yeah, vidocq.org. What's on that? Do they have a, a list, like a list of cases they've handled and wins and losses, something like they that? They have a, on that they describe who they are and that they, they only uh, will do, uh, investigate cold cases they choose to investigate that are brought to them, that cold cases de by definition that are at least two years old. So if the cops are still eight months into an investigation, they won't look at it. And most importantly, they have to be requested, it has to be an innocent victim. I mean, if the drug, the drug dealer's mother is probably upset that he was murdered, but they don't, they're not going to check out that death or, you know, look into it. And uh, they have to, you know, basically people will come forward, either the police department will contact them directly because they respect the Bedock Society, have heard about them, and they really want help. Either uh, I've seen bef appear before the Bedock Society a sort of an aging cop who's about to retire, and this is the one that he really wants to solve. Or last month or the month before, a young uh, officer from in India, Indigo, Indio, California, in the desert somewhere outside of Palm Springs, and this killing that's been sort of a cold case in his department for years, and he's just started there, and they say, here, kid, read these three boxes, you know, and he shows up, and now he's got this case. The police have to come directly, or often motivated by the family. So fr frequently a family member will just be, won't give up, and they're trying, to, trying anything, and they hear about the Bedock Society. But then they have to, they contact the Bedock Society, but then if the Bedock Society is interested, they make it clear, you have to go to, to the family member, you have to go to the police and get their cooperation. They have to call us. We can't barge in here. Why is it located in Philadelphia? Well, Bill Fleischer is from Philadelphia, you know, uh, uh, several generations, uh, and Frank Bender. Uh, and so that's where it had its genesis. Uh, and it's fitting in a way. I mean, Philadelphia has a sort of proud and also sordid history as a capital of crime. I mean, Ted Bundy, of all people, is from here. I don't know if people can know that. And, of course, the, the killer who uh, was part of the, featured in that big bestseller, The Devil in the White City, who was, you know, H. H. Dr. H. H. Holmes was hung in Philadelphia, caught by a Philadelphia detective. There's sort of this gothic, you know, history here. But in the present day, because, uh, and, and, and maybe not an accident really, because in 1990 when they, when they formed, uh, you know, we're all familiar now with serial killers. And the word was in the, in fact, as Badak Society member Bob Ressler is credited with coining the term serial killers, you know, and he's written books about his hunting down and interviewing, you know, Jack the, I mean, not Jack the Ripper, but, you know, the modern equivalents like, like Bundy and, and John Wayne Gacy. And, um, uh, you know, in 1990, uh, we were familiar with that term, but it was really, I think, cresting then. The feeling of being out of control was, uh, 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 what it, Silence of the Lambs had just come out based on a Vidoc Society, you know, member, life story partly, Bob Ressler, he's not the killer, he was the, uh, the FBI agent who puts Hannibal Lecter away, basically. Um, and at the time in Philadelphia, one of the worst serial killers ever, Mar uh, uh, Gary Heidnick, was working. And there were three at the same time. I don't know if you remember, Gary Heidnick, Marty Graham, and a third one. It was just terrible. So I think when they met and had lunch, there was a sense among cops, certainly, that cops are overworked, uh, the bad guys are winning, and someone's got to do something. Do they tend to select cases where the killers are a little crazy, or are killers crazy kind of by definition? That's an interesting case, uh, interesting question. Since they're not a bureaucracy or a government agency, they can select the cases that interest them. And I do think that they're, they're human beings. They're interested in particularly unusual cases, uh, but mostly where they can help. It's funny, it's, it's, a, it's a human business in the end. And do they like the people who bring? Do they want to help the cops? Do they get along with the cops? Do they feel sympathy for the victim? Do they think they can get the bad guy? All those things play into it. But I know Richard Walter, for instance, is, you know, if he's bored by something, he's just not interested, you know. Do the cops ever poo-poo their conclusions? 
Oh, sure. Uh, you know, there's, uh, and I think the attention in this, they poo poo each other's conclusions. You know, uh, there's, there are cases where Walter and Bender will be sure there's a killer, and Fleischer will say, You're crazy. Yeah, but I think that's healthy. We want that. None of us really knows the mystery of the human mind, and certainly the human murdering mind. And we want that sort of, uh, uh, I think, hurly burly disagreement to try to get to the truth. That's what they're after. Speaking of the human mind, uh, you have a scene where Frank Bender was present at his, his father's autopsy. Right. And he held his father's heart in his hand. Right. Did he tell you that story? Yes. Why did he tell you it, and why did he do it? Uh, you know, I think he wanted to feel his father's essence. Frank is a very spiritual man. Um, maybe a sense of control. I don't know, you know, if you wanted to look at it in a darker way. Uh, Frank, when Frank touches a human form and a dead human form, he gets more out of it than the rest of us do. I think it was essentially a loving act, tending for tending to him, and that's how he told me about it, and I believe that. Uh, you can see why I think uh, just about anyone could write a best-selling book about these <laughs> characters. I mean, I, I just am so, so struck, to even to this day, how amazing they are, and very open about these things, um, you know, about their picadillos and eccentricities. What do they think about how the book turned out? I'm relieved to say they love it, you know, uh, and it was never clear that they would. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a lot of back and forth intention. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really let them read it till the very last minute, and only because I thought it was practical. Uh, Richard Ben Kramer is a sort of famous old uh, Philadelphia Inquirer reporter, and I interviewed him once uh, after he went on and became uh, famous for writing um, What It Takes, a book mm -hmm. about the presidential candidates. And he told me that he sort of uh, not broke journalistic convention, but maybe extended it a bit and showed, ev showed it all to them before it was published. And he found that for every one tiny thing they want to remove, they gave him 20 new facts, you know, things he didn't know and corrected mistakes. So that worked out pretty well. Um, are you working on another book? Yes, uh, I have a, a book proposal all done actually on, and I wish I could tell you the name because I love this story, but a, um, uh, a, there's one of the richest women in the world at the turn of the century, who was quite famous then, uh, died a natural death. Uh, but in fact, I will be able to demonstrate in this book that she was murdered by one of the most famous scientists of the day. And um, it's because of my experience with these detectives that I'm able to sort of have the confidence or the insight to, through their expertise, to look at a story that has been seen but not recognized for what it is. So I, I think I'll be working on that. But, you know, one of the things about the market today, uh, you know, with this book on the bestseller list and a the ABC special coming up, you know, maybe the publisher will want some sort of follow. So I have to sort of surf along on possibility here, you know. And y you've been done book signings with the three Vidoc Society members? Yes. How do people treat them? They love them. I mean, it's, uh, and, and when I've done some media interviews, uh, I'm grateful to be talking about the book and the author, and sometimes that's happened. But often uh, reporters will go right to the detectives, and that's the point. I mean, when you're doing a book like this, I think of myself as just a Sherpa guide. You know, they're the, they're the ones going up the mountain. It's their story. I'm trying to shine a light on how wonderful or how incredible or how controversial or how interesting they are. And uh, so what will happen is in a public setting, uh, the, the gaze quickly shifts to them, and I'm grateful for that. I see myself as kind of the setup man, you know. Sometimes they get lost in detail or abstractions, and I'll cut in and try and summarize something. We are out of time. We've been speaking with Michael Capuzzo. He is the author of this book, The Murder Room, the story of the Vidoc Society in Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details. Like us on Facebook.